This video is sponsored by Skillshare. The first 206 viewers who use the link below will get their first two months on Skillshare for free. The migration period didn't stop with the Ostrogoths. Around the same time, two tribes called the Lombards and the Franks had slowly moved southward in search of new land. The Lombards found themselves squeezed between the emerging Frankish kingdoms and nomadic invaders under the Avars, forcing them ever more southward. The Lombards slowly moved into central Italy, conquering the tired and war-ravaged countryside. They set up the Kingdom of Lombardy as well as two semi-autonomous duchies in the south, making Italy look a lot more like a jigsaw puzzle than anything resembling a nation. The Byzantines struggled to maintain control of the area but retained at least nominal territory. The popes in Rome began securing this section under their direct control. Thousands of Italian refugees fled the countryside from the Lombard invasions and settled in the Venetian Lagoon eventually becoming the legendary founders of Venice, the floating city. The Pope signed an alliance with the Carolingian Franks and teamed up to fight the Lombards. In return, the leader Charlemagne was crowned the first Holy Roman Emperor and the Papal States were granted full independence. The Popes also built walls around the Vatican to keep out pesky Arab raiders. Speaking of which, the Islamic Umayyads and the Abbasids began conquering parts of Sicily and Sardinia the latter of which actually managed to repel their attack, setting up independent states called the Judicati. Who saw that coming, right? Charlemagne's Frankish Empire splintered after his death, but was soon united by Otto I in Germany. The south was being conquered by the Normans, while the Lombard kingdoms fractured into civil war. Around the same time, the maritime republics began to increase in power and wealth. I'll go into more detail about these republics in a separate video, since it gets pretty complicated. The House of Habsburg inherited much of the Italian lands, putting them in personal union with many foreign rulers. Some of these rulers, like the Spanish Habsburgs and the French, fought a series of devastating wars in among the states of Italy for control over the peninsula, called the Italian Wars, only further establishing Habsburg control over the area. The Catholic Counter-Reformation of Catholic States against Protestant states began the Thirty Years' War, which is one of the deadliest conflicts of all time. Over in the east, the Byzantines had recently fallen to the Ottoman Turks, and the Italian republics took in many intellectual refugees, who brought with them many long-forgotten Greco-Roman books and culture. The rich Italian cities had the money to waste on translating these books, resulting in the Renaissance, a rebirth of classical period culture. The Renaissance would also stimulate learning and the Enlightenment, bringing Europe out of the so-called Dark Ages. The Enlightenment ideas became Italy's largest export, from faraway Moscow to nearby Paris. In Paris, it stimulated the French Revolution. As an unintended consequence in the 1800s, Napoleon's armies invaded Italy in his war with the Habsburgs. So, win some, lose some, I guess. In the Congress of Vienna, the borders were redrawn again following Napoleon's defeat. But the birth of an Italian national consciousness, as well as centuries of foreign rule, stimulated the Unification Wars, and the Kingdom of Sardinia spent the better part of the next century conquering the rest of Italy from the French and Austrian royal houses, under King Victor Emmanuel II and his famous general, Giuseppe Garibaldi, finally unifying it into a modern nation-state. Except for the Pope, who was still hiding behind his walls. The subject of Italian unification is extremely complex, and my friend Griffin from the Armchair Historian is actually covering this subject in detail. That's right, James. Over on my channel, we've extensively covered this very chapter of Italy's history. The unification of Italy was a very long and drawn-out process, full of numerous geopolitical and social events. In fact, the ramifications extended far past the peninsula itself, as the wars of Italian unification actually led many to seek new opportunities by leaving for the New World, causing the Great Italian Diaspora. So if you want to know more about the unification itself, feel free to stop by at the Armchair Historian. Thanks for having me, James. Please be sure to check out the video I collaborated on over at the Armchair Historian after this. The newly united Kingdom of Italy joined the Triple Alliance with Austria and Germany. However, when the First World War broke out in the Balkans, the Italians remained neutral, only switching sides to the Entente in 1915 in exchange for promises of new land. They opened up a large front against Austria in the Alpine passes but made very little progress. A joint offensive in 1917 of British, French and Italian forces finally managed to put pressure on the crumbling Austria-Hungary. 
The war ravaged the young state, amounting some 650,000 casualties and more than a million wounded. In exchange, they were granted far less territory than they realized, and the country was plagued with economic decline. This left Italy feeling alienated from their Western allies. A young socialist named Benito Mussolini, himself a soldier in the war, used the turmoil to create a new ultra-nationalist movement called Fascismo. Mussolini was eager to expand Italy's holdings in Africa to prove his nation's racial superiority, a new Roman Empire. So, in 1922, he and the fascists orchestrated a coup, the March on Rome, installing Mussolini as dictator. Not long after, the fascist ideas and groups began springing up all over Europe, including Spain and especially Germany, where its philosophy laid the framework of National Socialism. Mussolini found a friend in Adolf Hitler and they soon formed an alliance based on mutual support. Although both Hitler and other European leaders viewed Mussolini as weak and opportunistic. In 1940, Italy declared war on France and Britain, officially entering the Second World War. However, a lack of resources and tactical errors meant that advancing into France was pretty stagnant. The Italians also fought in North Africa, Albania and Greece, but had to be aided by the Germans to overcome the enemy. The joint invasion of Yugoslavia went very well for the Axis, bringing the whole of the Balkans under their control. The extra troops and resources diverted to the South disrupted plans for the Nazi invasion of the USSR, delaying the operation for over a month. Historians believe this to be a contributing factor in the Wehrmacht failure to capture Moscow and beating the start of winter, since the invasion was launched so late. The Italian army contributed some 230,000 troops to the invasion with about 90,000 estimated casualties. Italy was invaded by a joint allied force in 1943, which soon pushed their way up toward Rome. Italy surrendered and Mussolini was deposed, but the Germans invaded from the north to secure their southern flank. It is during this campaign that the Wehrmacht killed thousands of civilians and POWs, including over 7,000 Jews. The decisive battle at Monte Cassino was an Allied victory, leading to yet another Allied advance. Mussolini was captured at the border of Switzerland trying to escape. The anti-fascist populace then executed him, shortly before the end of the war. In 1946, the Italian countryside, ravaged again by war and famine, was given a referendum to establish a republic. The monarchy was abolished and the country became part of the Western democratic sphere of the Cold War. The communist members of parliament were expelled in 1947. However, the young republic suffered from economic hardship, especially in the south, causing many to emigrate for better opportunities elsewhere, such as the USA, Argentina and Australia. Italy became a founding member of NATO, the European Coal and Steel Community, and its eventual counterpart, the European Union. Today, Italy still suffers from economic hardship as well as a large wage gap, but the economy is still growing. The switch to the euro in 1999 brought with it cheaper loans and investment opportunities. Italy is one of the most visited countries in the world, with Milan, Venice, Rome, Naples, Genoa and Florence being huge cultural and economic hubs, with some of Europe's most successful companies. A question I find all the time in the comments is James, how do you make these videos? And then on hearing the answer, they take one look at the animation and illustration professional software such as Adobe Illustrator and After Effects and how complicated they appear to be. But we live in a world where you can learn almost anything online and that's exactly how I taught myself. I used video tutorials like this one on Skillshare on the basics of Adobe Premiere Pro by Geordie van der Put with 6,808 other students. But it doesn't just stop there. Skillshare has thousands of courses to help you learn new skills, such as the one I am taking now on Simple Character Animation by Fraser Davidson. Believe me, when I started this channel more than a year ago, I had no idea how to do even the most basic loop out cycles. So whether it's business and finance, design, technology or film, there's something for everyone at Skillshare. Italy declared their republic on the 2nd of June 1946, and this is now remembered as the Festa della Repubblica Day every year. So, the folks at Skillshare are offering the first 206 viewers who use the link below their first two months on Skillshare for free. Thank you for watching. Remember to stop by the Armchair Historian for the second part of this collaboration. If you like the channel, please like and subscribe, and consider pledging over at Patreon to support the creation of more videos. Until next time.